What is a labor victory? I maintain that it is a twofold thing. Workers must gain economic advantage, but they must also gain a revolutionary spirit. Yeah. Yes! This is what they must do in order to achieve a complete victory. For workers to go back with a few cents more a day, a few minutes less a day, but the same psychology, the same attitude towards society, means is to have achieved a temporary victory, but not a lasting one. For workers to go back with a class-conscious spirit, with the organization and determination, attitude towards society, means that even if they have no economic advantage, they have the possibility of gaining in the future. Workers gaining in the future. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, a labor victory must be economic and revolutionizing. Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, it is not complete. Workers of the world, unite! 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 I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She was this gorgeous, precocious, Irish, working class girl. She left high school at 15 with an A student and became an IWW organizer. By 20, 21 years old, she was uh, involved in some of the major labor struggles of this century. When the miners were striking in Minnesota, she was there. When the silk workers were striking in Patterson, she was there. Her life kind of crossed with my life in that at 21 years old, she um, came to my hometown of Lawrence, Massachusetts, and she led one of the most successful labor strikes in U.S. history. It's called the Bread and Roses Strike. Here's a photo of her with the organizers in Lawrence. That's her great love. And this is Big Bill Hayward, who is the founder of the International Workers of the World. These guys didn't quite get it until she showed them. She came to town with an idea that the way that you're going to win this was to organize the women, free women from child care and laundry and cooking which she did by collectivizing the kitchens and the laundry and making everyone participate, including men. There were 56 languages spoken on the strike committee. Everybody would sing, which is really what united people, you know, across, across languages. She got the women organized to close down all the bars. They literally took wood and boarded up all the bar rooms. She came up with a brilliant strategy, which was to send the children away to families in New York. They were filled with rickets and tuberculosis and they had, you know, lice and they were malnourished. These were people that had been working at, kids that had been working in the mills. Madison Square Garden had a huge benefit. So all that pressure won that strike. They won the right to organize the trades as a group rather than independently and pit them against each other. My grandmother was a child laborer. She made $2.98 a week after 54 hours of work a week. But actually her conditions were slightly improved because the year before, as she entered, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn had won this battle. She fell in love at the time with her Italian anarchist lover, Carlos Tresca, and they had a very tumultuous 13 years together. But she always put the work first. So, for example, he got out of jail and wanted to know why she wouldn't spend time with him. And she said, because there's other people in jail. And she went right back to the Defense Committee offices and said, sorry, but that's the priority. She always wanted to be a constitutional lawyer, but she never even graduated high school. So she defended herself in numerous cases um, throughout her life. And she formed defense committees for many famous and not so famous uh, folks. Sacco and Benzetti, Edder and Giovanetti, Joe Hill's defense, her cases went to the Supreme Court. She was a founding member of the ACLU, only about 25 years later to be thrown out of the ACLU <laughs> because she was a member of the Communist Party at one point. She was the first female chair of the Communist Party. She understood also very young how important it was. Um, how African Americans were being treated, how immigrants were being treated. She was involved in the anti-World War I activity, which got her arrested and put in jail the first time. The Palmer Raids, which arrested immigrants who were supposed to be communists and then sent them off to jail. The Smith Act, which basically said that anyone who was subverting the government, right, talking about a revolution, she was arrested for that. <laughs> The McCarthy hearings, she was put in jail for two years. She understood that in this time when there was no media, except printed media and the, the voice, 
that um, she needed to be able to put down a box, stand on a corner, or stand in front of 20,000 people, which she did routinely, and speak her piece, was her phrase. And men listened to her too. You see these pictures of her speaking in front of 50,000 people. It's mostly men. She would go on a tour and she would give 35 speeches in a week. She wrote three columns a week for 25 years. She wrote an average of six letters a day. Here's a woman of great uh, depth, um, education, self-taught, beauty, uh, power, but spent a life uh, giving back to people who had less than she did. And my favorite quote of hers is when she said, um, I'm very proud of the life that I've lived but very humbled in the living of it. And that just, you know, t t touches me.